You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Borspuya. In this week's program, we interview Victoria Bergenheim on art, science and body as an ultimate weapon of enlightenment. We'll also be speaking about executions in Iran and Saudi Arabia, Islamic human rights, honor killings in Pakistan, a British woman who is being held hostage in Saudi Arabia, a fatwa basically saying that it's fine to steal from music schools, and a wonderful movement for enlightenment in Afghanistan. Stay with us. In the week that passed, we had news of the record number of executions in Iran and Saudi Arabia, 350 so far, and Iran is now the, uh, and continues to be, the second highest country that issues executions after China, and it's about four people every three days. And this is non-stop um, execution of innocence, effectively. Most of the time, some people have actually been arrested for carrying five gram of heroin mm. and they ended up being executed in Iran. So that's a means of oppression in Iran and the Islamic regime of Iran and Saudi Arabia are actually competing with each other. You'll see that's the face of the Islamists in power and actually a face of any dictatorship. Execution is a means of denying human rights, denying fundamental civil rights and essentially has been used against their opponents. I think where we do see executions, whether it's in the United States, whether it's China, whether it's Iran, it increases the level of, you know, the legitimacy of violence, mm -hmm. and particularly when it's violence against the state, it is the worst type of murder, isn't it? And what's interesting is you've got Larry Johnny, who is the head of the Department of Human Rights of the Islamic Republic of Iran. like. You know, uh, now that's a joke. You know, he must go home laughing every day. And he's basically said that real human rights is the, you know, it's the true face of Islam and Islamic human rights is the ultimate of all human rights. Um, what and drugs is he on? Um, on the Islamic sort of human rights yeah. drug, effectively. Is There's no such thing as um, Islamic human rights. Islamic human rights is justification of violation of uh, human rights mm -hmm. And that is very clearly shown in Iran and um, Saudi Arabia and anywhere that Islamists have, have power. It's interesting, he is part of one of the three brothers who dominate the um, you know, power sort of centers in Iran, judiciary, the um, majlis, um, assembly, and, assembly, assembly, and supposedly the human rights now. And these are part of a group of people who've continued over the last 37 years to enforce the Position by execution and murder. Um, this month is the 35th anniversary of the 1988 massacre of political prisoners. Yeah, I think you're 37. Yeah, um, yeah, and this this is you know the, the, there are many families who still don't know where the loved ones are buried. Yeah, and of course, continuing from that, I think is uh, it's important to also talk about the fact that there's been some well-known cases of honor killings in Pakistan. Of course, honor killings takes place in many countries, and particularly countries where, or communities where religion has a stronghold, uh, you know, and patriarchal values have a stronghold. And you're, you've heard of two uh, important cases. One is, of course, Gandhil Baluch, where there's been huge amounts of outrage and, and protests as a result of her honor killing by her brother. And now uh, news has come of two other young women who've been killed by their brother again because they wanted to uh, marry the men of their choice. Their names are um, Kosar and Golzar Bibi. And interesting that there's always opposition in these countries against this. You saw huge outrage. And that's the point we're trying to make in this program, that uh, there is a voice of opposition to Islamic and reactionary uh, rules and tradition that needs to be recognized, supported, and, and effectively promoted. That's the only way we could 
who could change this society and push back the reactionary forces who are operating in these societies. Yeah, and also what, what's very clear, the, the two young girls that were killed, the two young women who were killed by their brother, the father was obviously not in favor of the honor killing, and he said that his son, who, who killed his two daughters, has destroyed the family. And, uh, you know, what, what a calamity for that family. They were going to be celebrating weddings, and uh, I think the brother killed them the day before their wedding, and now they have to organize funerals for the two women. Uh, and of course, there's another case of a woman now. She's a British woman, Amina Al Jafari. She is. Um, she's contacted a friend here in Britain, saying that she's being held in a cage, effectively, uh, by her father because he's not happy with her behavior, which is basically, you know, wearing makeup and um, having a boyfriend and so on and so and, forth. Uh, and living no normal life. Um, the important thing is that uh, Amina needs to be freed effectively and be supporting the campaign on her case. And but she needs to be brought back to Britain. Absolutely. She is a British citizen. Absolutely. So. But that uh, sort of indicates and shows that life of many women in uh, in Islamic ridden societies like Saudi Arabia and Iran who actually want to break free and they don't want to live in these circumstances. Recently, I met with Victoria Guggenheim and interviewed her about her fantastic work in doing body painting and her really interesting views on everything from art, science to uh, the body as a protest tool. Stay with us and watch this wonderful interview. Hello, Victoria. Thank you for Hello. joining us. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> I want to uh, talk to you about the brilliant work you do, body painting. You're an award-winning body painter. You've done a million great things. Tell me first about why you do body painting. Okay, well, um, you could say I'm under compulsion, if you like, because um, I started when I was very, very young. Um, so I started around six or so doing makeup, and then um, I had my first set of face paints, I think at about nine years old, and then it just sort of progressed downwards, and it's always stayed with me. And um, the more I got into body paint, the more I was excited about it, because it's actually the oldest art form in the world. It's 300,000 years old, and it's actually... I find it very empowering to be part of this really long tradition of, of people, you know, painting on themselves and, and experimenting. Um, and I, I love that I can just use this for um, pretty much any medium that I want. So if I want to um, express a scientific idea, I can do this on a body because it's the most immediate, visceral form of communication you have with people. You know, rather than it being something very abstract on canvas, if it's immediately relatable, then people they respond to it so much, so much more readily, and I find that um, it's that connection that really kind of keeps me going. And the body art world never stands still. So there's always new innovations. There's new technologies you can use. There's new things you can, you know, even end up painting. You can paint for protest. You can paint for anything you want. And um, I don't think I'm ever going to get tired of it. So that that's why it's one it's one long lifelong compulsion to just paint. I think. <laughs> your favorite things that you painted oh wow um so my first one is probably you know you know i've painted lawrence krauss which is you know um the guy who wrote the physics of star trek a universe from nothing um that was fantastic for me and uh my um, my next favorite is probably um on a late friend of mine sean jones um and i did this to raise breast cancer awareness and i um it's called immortal enemies and um it's an accurate depiction of um, cancer cells that are attempting to metastasize. And um, I wanted to basically paint this because, first of all, his mother died of breast cancer. And um, this is a charity that's very important to me as well because uh, my grandmother died of breast cancer too. So um, I wanted to do something that was beautiful, that would really just, you know, convey how, um, you know, how much this, this disease can take away that, you know, someone's sense of personhood and also um, do something about it so um, when I sell a piece of a, a copy of Immortal Enemies now um, you know the money goes to um, you know breast cancer charities um, and I just yeah I, I think that's probably yeah they're my two favorites I'd say at the point yes at this point and you, you do quite a lot of protest art you, you talk about that as well and how, why is 
protest art so important, particularly when it comes to the body? Well, um, I would say that you know, if you are expressing bodily autonomy, that is something that is really important because there's so many factors in the world that seek to either objectify you as a woman or keep you down as a human being. Um, I mean, if you look at the current political climate here, um, you know, it's it's horrible, it's oppressive, and people feel that, and they get disconnected, and they feel disenchanted and disillusioned, and they feel like they can't do something, and you can. If you are painting yourself, it's a brush, paints, and you, and no one can tell you what to do. No one can say, oh, you shouldn't be painting that. You're the one making that decision. There is no middleman telling you what you can and can't do with your body. And so this is why I love using body paint in terms of that. I, I know this is why I've done topless activism. You know, this is why, um, you know, I've obviously painted you twice. Um, and I want to carry on doing that. I want people to realise just how powerful this art form is. Because if you're confronted with a painted body or, you know, in the case of Spencer Tunic, for example, several hundred painted bodies, you can't ignore that, you know, that's on the street, like in broad daylight, this person is painted and in front of you, there's no getting away from it. So, you know, for me, it's like, it's the ultimate art of protest, if you like, because, you know, there's going to be something as well, when you're working with protesters, and you're, you know, you're, if you like, I, I don't want to use it in a non-scientific way, but there's, there's kind of a social energy, if you like, when, you know, there's things kind of going on, and you're kind of sensing the atmosphere, I think is the best way of, of uh, saying it, because we're very social animals, and there's things that can come out, can come out in a protest painting, um, that you wouldn't, you know, on the day, that you wouldn't necessarily do in a studio. Um, and it can be much more powerful, much more immediate, much more visceral. And that's why I think it's, it's so important to carry on doing that. And that's why I enjoy doing protest paintings, because I think, you know, it's a way of almost um, ethically shocking people into realising there is a problem that needs to be addressed. Mm. So I hope that's a good enough answer. Yeah, no, definitely. And what, so ca carrying on from that is, from your perspective, the importance of art mm. in raising awareness and shocking. Yes. Um, well, the thing is, um, you know, art is one of the oldest tools we've got, really, in terms of communication, I think. And I find that, as well, I mean, if you look at art and science, they share a common ancestor in the human imagination. Art is a way of keeping imagination active and alive and engaged. And we are very, very visual creatures. You know, that's one of the oldest senses I believe we have. So if you're engaging this, um, you know, there's a, some really interesting research actually from Jean-Pierre Changeau uh, of art as an entire brain experience. Um, and it's actually on his Carter lecture, um, where if you look at a piece of art, um, you have a, a limbic sense that happens. So you have your limbic system kicking in. And you go, what's that? And then once you sort of solve the puzzle as, as to what it is, your prefrontal cortex kicks in and you start acting, you start asking questions about the work and, oh, how did they do this? And why did they do this? And what's the motivation of the artist? And then immediately, um, and this has been confirmed on brain scan, you know, this isn't something I'm speculating. Um, immediately, you've got people active and engaged in something that's just in front of them and so just from all of these factors really I mean I'd love to go into into much more detail but I don't have much time um, from all of these factors I think it's just a really integral part of the human condition it's one of the reasons we were able to um, explore altered mind states as well um, on the Pleistocene um, so there's been lots of kind of cave paintings as well of um, you know human beings and animals having shared experiences if you like so um, you know they have both been depicted side by side um, both with their hair standing on end and that sort of thing and so you know that's conveying a shared experience through the medium of art and so you can also do this in a sense of community as well you can get lots of people together and, and paint as one you know that's a massive you know possibility for change so you know with all of these factors I I can't see how this can be left out it's it's vital I think so I think art can be the lifeblood of protest if you like yeah definitely as a final question, you do a lot of uh, your body painting uh, in relation to scientific issues. Mm. There, there will be people who will say that there's a contradiction between art and science. Mm. What's your view on that? Well, um, I would say, you know, like I've said before, I, I think um, art and science share a common ancestor in the human imagination. If there isn't any imagination, you can't actually hypothesize. There's no hypothesizing. And um, I think what art has done historically in human evolution is give us a place to actually um, 
think about ideas and experiment. So um, if you look at, um, for, for example, um, Neanderthal makeup kits, there's different fat, oil and pigment ratios in these particular things. And when you look at things like this, it's clear that they were using that as a tool for experimentation. And, you know, that's sort of a precursor, if you like, to the scientific method. Um, and, you know, I think artists and scientists, they're, all, they're both very curious. Um, artists are especially information hunter-gatherers. If they want to do something, they will... You, there's no stopping them. They will research the hell out of something. You know, it will be all-consuming. So just like, you know, just like Newton would be all-consuming and be, you know, really excited about something and get um, very um, curious about something and, and doggedly pursue the idea you know, artists have that determination. Um, and what I think is just a crying shame is that probably because of some modern art, people think that art is no longer relevant and is somehow useless and doesn't have any business kind of conveying, um, you know, scientific ideas. But actually, I think that um, art is one of the best ways in which to convey scientific ideas because what you're doing is you're you're being almost a visual translator of the medium if you like instead of someone who has no science background sitting down and reading a scientific paper and probably getting lost in it um, I would encourage people to try of course um, what you can do is um, take that information and create something so beautiful and so compelling that people immediately want to know about it because again you're you're kind of tickling their, their visual cortex um, so, I mean, one of my um, pieces was called Some of Her Parts, and I had, um, this was about the war of gene patenting in America. Um, that was, it was raging at the Supreme Court at the time. And, um, you know, so I had neurons firing off, I had someone's real sequence genome on my model's arm, um, I had a picture of an X chromosome, I had DNA strand, you know, like, everything I could put in there to kind of convey this message, I did. And I had people literally coming to me going, oh my God, this is amazing. Can you take me through everything you've done? And I'm thinking, this is brilliant. These people want to be educated. And I, I remember as well, I had um, one fantastic experience when I was uh, talking at a mini exhibition of mine and I painted a, a 3D anglerfish on someone um, as part of a body paint called Elegantum Queen of the Deep. And um, this person came to me and said, I didn't even know these fishes existed. <laughs> I thought, this is amazing. And now this person wants to be a deep sea diver. Like he wants, and, and actually study oceanography. And that's from looking at someone who's been painted with an anglerfish on their chest. I mean, that's just a fundamental force for good. I mean, and a force for change and for science education. And so they, they should be bedfellows they should be celebrated because they have so much that they can give each other you can't have art without you know science and materials engineering and the latex technology because you know there's so many um, technology based artists and science based artists out there now and you can't really convey science without at least some form of visual appeal and art I think so embrace it communicate with each other and you know just welcome each other into your communities, ask questions, challenge each other and, you know, work together just to create something bigger and bolder and better because, you know, that's the way forward, I think. Thank so, yes. You. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the interview with Victoria Guggenheim. I think she raises so many points. She is quite a brilliant woman, honestly. Wonderful, wonderful. She's one... Every aspect of her work is wonderful. She's done so many wonderful things. She's helped us a lot in our various protests as well. And, um, you know, I think one of the points that she raises, which is hugely important, is about the body. You know, it, the body is, of course, a battleground of, for religion, culture, you know, um, just uh, its commodification, its use, and women's bodies in particular as a form of... Uh, you know, for control and for suppression, for oppression, and how the body can also be such an important tool for liberation. And the immediacy of it, yes. the fact that it's there, yeah. and the relationship between body and pain and the history of that. But a striking thing for me uh, from the interview you uh, did with Victoria was uh, the issue of how art and um, um, science, they're very close with each other, the imagination, the fact that you can't really have one without the other, and that's, they're so close with each other. I think that was uh, wonderful.
insane fatwa of this week is from Iran, a treasure trove of insane fatwas. The whole government is insane and its judges and on and on and on. And so you've got this case of a music school ahead. Her name is Azita Bakshmand. And she uh, had um, taken someone to court for stealing from her school. The judge, however, found that the person wasn't guilty. Actually, because, and, uh, because she, mm. a director of the music school, is engaged in sinful activity. That's mm. music. Therefore, mm. stealing from the sinful activity is fine. A guy has not committed any crime. This is it. Case That's, closed. <laughs> just start going to the music shops, music school, just take anything you want. anything you want. According to Islamic sort of law. You can do it. Marvelous. <laughs> so basically, not only was the thief let off, but now she's been basically condemned effectively condemned for, for having a profession that is sinful. Music. Music. We're talking about music. That's Islam for you. Insane, insane, insane. The slice of life this week is from Afghanistan and it is the Enlightenment movement. This is in response to the killing of over 80 people, Hazara people in Afghanistan in a protest in Kabul, the wounding of over 230 people and basically the protest was uh, calling on the government to bring electricity to Hazara areas. The Hazaras are a minority in Afghanistan and you know all these people were killed and in response there is this enlightenment movement calling and for light against the dark. And mass of people have come on the streets and they are demanding sort of uh, the rights and also they're doing it under the banner of enlightenment. I mean this is beautiful, you know, Roshanai, lighting and enlightenment and they've mixed that sort of metaphor of light and enlightenment and they are fighting for that. I mean that's what we've said in the most sort of supposedly backward society that the most religious and stupid people are in power, the power of people and opposition to these rules exists and needs, needs to be supported and, and, and protected. Definitely. We hope you've enjoyed this week's program. We look forward to seeing you again at the same time and same place next week. Until then, have a wonderful week. Goodbye. Goodbye. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. 
Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.